Oh, I forget. I think it was last week. I uh, I attended the uh, uh, annual September two-day meeting of the New York State Bishops down in Douglaston. And I got there the night before, and uh, I enjoyed dinner with one of the auxiliary bishops of the Archdiocese of New York. And we started speaking of sports. And he told me that um, not every weekend, but many weekends, he would celebrate Mass at Yankee Stadium Sunday morning with the Yankees and the visiting team if they didn't have an evening game that was covered by ESPN. So I don't know what that, what that had to do with one or the other. But he would, he would celebrate Masses there. And he would speak about some of the faithful Yankee Giants. He would talk about, he would tell me about Yogi Berra, how um, he, they want, once he died, they wanted to have this big um, funeral mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral, but he said no. The family said no, he wanted it back in his home parish. Daily communicant, Yogi Berra. He spoke about Joe Garagiola. He was just speaking about some of the, uh, the giants that, that we're aware of in, on the Yankee team who were die-hard practicing Catholics. He mentioned one in particular, I have to be honest, um, I don't follow the Yankees that closely, I, I'm a Mets fan. <laughs> but he told me about a gentleman named Dan, I think it's Dan Phelps, um, a pitcher. He uh, pitched a two-hitter on a Saturday, and this bishop had an ash the next day. And he got a conversation with this Phelps about his background. He um, was a graduate of Notre Dame. There was one assignment that he had, I don't remember, I think it was a sociology class or something. There was an assignment that he had where he had to work with a partner. And there was this female student that uh, was chosen to be his partner. Well, the project was completed, and she did all the work. He was the athlete, she did all the work, and she really resented that. He, um, he took a shining to her. He really found her very attractive, and he wanted to get her more, more acquainted with her. So, um, I think there was a third party that somehow managed to <coughs> allow communication between the two to take place. She was insistent. She heard that he was Catholic. She was insistent that before she would even go on one date with him, he needed to start going to Mass. Then she would spend some time with him. Well, the short story, long story short, he started going to Mass, they started a relationship, they got married, had a couple of kids, and he's very, very um, committed to his faith. He was telling the story how they were at Mass one Sunday and the two girls weren't, two daughters weren't behaving and he was all apologetic and how the pastor was so considerate and, and don't worry, I just thank God that you're here. Um, but he began to be a, one of these inspirational speakers and he would go to different places uh, throughout the New York area and the theme of his talks were always use the gifts that God has given you. Use the gifts that God has given you. The greatest gift that God has given us is the Eucharist. And this is the guy who just pitched a two-hitter, plays for the Yankees, talking about the greatest gift that he has and recognizing the greatest gift that we have is the Eucharist. Um, so he got, I don't think he got traded or sold, but now he's on the disabled list for the Seattle Mariners. He's not a Yankee anymore. But that personally inspired me because you don't think of athletes and you don't think of Eucharist um, other than, I, I remember hearing once, in fact, I was sharing that with, with the bishop, Mike Piazza, he used to catch the Mets um, when he was in, uh, in minors. Uh, whenever he went out of town for a weekend, he always had to go to the Yellow Pages and find out where the mass and churches were to go to mass because his mother would always call him up if he was an adult. <laughs> so he was, yeah. But the Eucharist, the Eucharist. So that was one story I wanted to share with you, how I was personally inspired just in the past week or so of this athlete, this 
multimillionaire with the money that, that he makes, and, and, and how Eucharist is absolutely central to his life and that of his family. Eucharist. Got back. Got back from uh, New York um, last week and started opening my mail. I got a rather lengthy letter from an 80-some-year-old widow. Now you can just imagine some of the letters I'm getting these days. <laughs> but it's very respectful. But she proceeded to tell me, in light of what's been happening in the church, that she can no longer consider herself a Catholic. She and her husband had raised their five children in the Catholic faith. She said that they had received all the sacraments. None of her children today participate at all in the life of the church, Catholic church. In her letter, she indicated that she's always had issues with church teachings. The all-male priesthood, contraception, abortion, going to confession. She revealed that she never really believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. She always knew, she always knew it was just, just a symbol. She apologized for disappointing me with the letter and asked me if I didn't mind if I would pray for her. That was not so personally an inspiring letter that I got. It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. I remember back um, as, as a priest at a chrism mass uh, when the misconduct thing erupted back in 2002 when Bishop Barbarito preached to us at the chrism mass. And that's what he started. He started with that phrase from the tale of, of two cities. The single, the single most identifying experience we share as Catholics is the Eucharist. These were two most unlikely stories about the Eucharist. For me, it's a reversal of what we expect. We expect to hear, you know, the athlete, the guy that has everything, to ah, poo-poo church and all that, that stuff that they believe and the teaching. And, and an 80-year-old lady who's raised her five kids in the faith and went through the sacraments and... Uh, reveals that she just can't buy most of what we believe. I asked myself, how did I, how did the church fail her? And on the other hand, what motivates Mr. Phelps for such a change in his life that continues with zeal and with passion and with hope to this very day. Now, I know that perhaps you were expecting some, I don't know, profound presentation on the Eucharist tonight from your bishop. But there is an elephant in the room these days, isn't there? There is an elephant in the room that's insisting to get some of our attention. And so tonight I wanted to use a little bit of time just digressing, perhaps from what your leaders had expected uh, with this presentation, <coughs> with a planned script, per se, on, uh, on the Eucharist. I want to share with you my perception of what's happening in church, and then maybe offer some some thoughts in light of those two stories about the Eucharist. I had alluded already, uh, so if I could just take a couple of things I've been in the news and um, just share with you some of I've shared this in, in other occasions, whether it's diocesan pastoral council, other councils, just my take on what you've been hearing. Uh, I, I got a letter out, there's another one coming out next week, and I just want to share with you 
if you don't mind. I, I think you're leaders in the church, and you need to hear from your leader um, my take and, and how we need to um, embrace the opportunity that we have before us um, to be church and, and, and to uh, avail of ourselves of the, the opportunity that we have as leaders in, in our parishes. Now you know, uh, not to spend a lot of time on, on the history, uh, you know that the, the Pennsylvania, the horrific stories about the reports from, from Pennsylvania. Um, they're horrendous. And I, and I guess sometimes I get disappointed because it almost seems everybody's got to write something, including bishops, <coughs> like one attacking the other, and everybody's trying to find a new description, a new adjective to talk about how terrible they feel. Um, there's no word that can embrace it all. But, uh, as horrific as that is, it's an opportunity for us to take a look at what's happened since the church started doing something in 2002. That's lost and all of that. Because all of those go back about 70 years. What's happened since 2002 in the entire state of, of those dioceses? I think there were two. Two instances. The Diocese of Augensburg, zero. Right, okay. So that's the first point I would make. Uh, the second is, as horrific as those stories are, and we have our own, we have our own, as horrific as those are, I, I, I think we need to look through those stories through the lens of the day. By that I mean we are <laughs> expecting what we know today in the areas of social science and psychiatry and what have you. And what we know today, we want to make judgments about what we knew back then. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, in our case, the Diocese of Augsburg, um, in many other cases, what's, what's been happening when, in, in too many cases, I mean, it was wrong. But what had happened in instances where an individual was um, accused and credible, um, we were told sometimes by law enforcement, um, sometimes social workers, that that individual needs to go away for rehab, for lack of a better phrase. And so, so the bishop would send that person, and then they would come back with the recommendation that they be reassigned, that they're ready to go. Um, we know that's wrong today, but that's the way it was handled back then. And to that, in all honesty, the church wanted to save things. The church didn't want to create scandal. So you add that with the fact that also the whole question of um, the trauma to the victim, especially if it was a child, if it were public. Uh, so there's a whole lot of other factors. And, and, and so I just want to mention that when you look at that, those horrific numbers, try to, however difficult it is, to, to look through the lens uh, of the difference in, in years and, and where, where we've been and, and where we are today. Um, since the, the um, 2002, uh, I know because I, I was on the front lines in, the, in my, other, my other job, we do report all of our cases to the district attorney. Um, we have a review board. In fact, I'm going to mention the names of the review board in that statement next week. We have an excellent uh, review board composed of professionals, psychiatrists, counselors, retired judges, moms, dads teachers, um, and, and, and so I, I go to them regularly um, for advice, and obviously when, when accusations come my way. And something else, again, it's really an opportunity
such an unfruitful and constructive and helpful dialogue as we had, they had with our review, two review board members. They got, they went to some of our parishes um, and, the, and the parish schools, and uh, while they made up a couple of suggestions that we might, we might want to look at, uh, that we need to look at, um, they were for, uh, they were very uh, very uh, satisfied with what they found in the Diocese of Oxford. And you know, this is the time when they're going to be looking for anything. You know, and so I'm very, very pleased again for the folks and in the, in the uh, our, our pastors and, and pastoral staff who have, uh, who work so hard to assure that our environments are safe. Um, and uh, lastly, the uh, IRCP. You know that in March I announced that we have the Independent Reconciliation and Compensation Program. We extended it by a month because of the number of allegations that hadn't completed, and so September 30th, the program uh, formally ended, um, and that's part of what you're gonna see in that, in that statement, a little bit of uh, the history, why I decided to do it, how we did it, um, lessons we've learned and continue to learn as a result of doing it, um, and uh, one of the lessons I've learned is uh, while we, we had uh, submitted names to the independent uh, mediators, there are victims. Uh, we all new ones. Many new ones surface as a result of this. Um, it, it just uh, that was a great. It was a surprise to me. Um, but anyway, you'll hear you'll hear more for me personally as as the bishop. I um, you know I mentioned earlier to someone when you have when you have to sit down and you listen to the stories of the victims. And, and you, you feel and you say, I'm so sorry that it's, he's not. Uh, and, and to think that it's, you know, it's a one-time thing, get over it kind of thing, you don't. You don't. And then I have a responsibility to give pastoral care and concern to my priests. To the priests who are so faithful and work in our parishes, and now we're all branded in many people's eyes, but I also have to show that pastoral care and concern for the perpetrator, for the priest who, uh, you know, by virtue of Christian charity and my responsibility as their bishop. And so, you know, when it comes to all sorts of questions, so we have to weigh rights and pastoral charity, and it gets, that's the reason why my hair's white. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, one last thing on, on this uh, point. Um, I, I've been telling it, as you know, our capital campaign that is ongoing, and this past a couple of weeks since we've been involved, embroiled in this, this situation, I, I've um, tried to um, assure those who. Uh, Donate whether it's to the campaign, whether it's to the bishops fund, whether it's to a particular ministry in the church, that the funds that we are using as part of that compensation to the victims, we do not touch those assets. Okay, we're sensitive to the intention of the donors, but where are you going to come up with that money? And we're talking lots of money. Um, as I mentioned here last night, so don't fall asleep on me for those who were here. <laughs> Uh, I learned a little thing a little bit last night because your your folks in the diocese are good stewards. Um, we are able to have some funds available. First of all, um, you know that we are self-insured, and uh, I, I mentioned last night when I go to bishops' meetings, I'm invited to go to one in particular uh, uh, dinner called the Bishops Protective Insurance Company. We were one of the founding members of that of that company. They always, always, always talk about the risk management in the Diocese of Augensburg. We have Jack Carter, who, um, in fact, I just got an email from him today. He said he completed his Eastern visits. The last one was here yesterday. I, I told the folks last night, I said, I looked all over for him because my one time I needed Jack Carter because I hit a deer. He wasn't in the office. I said, I know where he was. He was here. We just, Doing a, but because we are conscious and our pastors and, and everybody in the parish are, are, are safety conscious, we haven't had the claims. And when we did have the claims, two humongous claims, 
the fire at St. Mary's in Ticonderoga and the fire at St. Mary's in Champlain, we did not see the tremendous spike in premiums as a result of that. So we've been able, uh, because of the savings we, we have in insurance and other investments uh, uh, um, that we've accumulated, uh, money accumulated, accumulated in investments that, that we've had, that's what we're going to um, tap into when it comes to our uh, needing to compensate. If we need to take a long-term loan, you know, we need, we need to do that. Um, so I just want to make that distinction for those who are concerned. I've gotten letters up the yin yang. I mean, I got several letters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You saw, I thought you remember one of them. I could, I could see him pointing his finger. I said him. But pointing his finger. You knew this all along when you had this capital campaign that you wanted it for this. Yeah. Yeah, right. But anyway, um, I just wanted to, to share some of that with you. Um, the last thing on, the, on this issue, Cardinal McCarrick, um, we're lo I'm looking for the facts. And, and the, uh, while we're, we're still a little shaky in, in, as far as the role of, of, of Rome is going to be, but uh, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops will be having um, an, an independent lay review, an investigation of what happened, uh, if indeed he has committed all these uh, <coughs> that's been alleged about him. Um, and, and secondly, which is a concern of mine, is there is no protocol, no procedure to follow if someone accuses a bishop. Um, so uh, I know that those issues are going to be addressed. Just yesterday I got an email from the president of USCCB which told me how they're going to be changing the Baltimore meeting Last year I couldn't go because, well, I couldn't move. I was in the hospital. I almost wish that would have happened this year. <laughs> <laughs> but if they're going to be switching what's going to happen and the plan, um, the, the agenda um, regarding prayer um, and some of the other agenda items are going to be focused on, on this and some of the other uh, items will need to uh, take back seat. So anyway, just to give you a, sort of a quick look at sort of what's happening out there. And, um, oh yeah, I don't want to forget, and, and by the way, we've been subpoenaed. Yeah. I don't know what does that mean, I've never been subpoenaed before in my life. <laughs> I was in my office one day, I don't know if you were in your office at the time, but one of the secretaries had walked out the back of the parking lot, and she was approached by somebody with a piece of paper in his hand. And she quickly said, uh, Father O'Brien's office is not there. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer that he is. And we were served a subpoena. Um, and, and now uh, what's happening basically are the diocesan attorneys are uh, communicating sort of with the Attorney General's uh, office to try to figure out what exactly they're looking for because it's, it's almost like a witch hunt uh, right now. Um, I, I just no idea where that's going to go. So um, I, I have to say, uh, I'm going to mention it Saturday when I'm with the Catholic Daughters, but I had a member of the Catholic Daughters she wants me to, to talk about Saturn. She said, what can we do to help you? And it's like, I, I like to think of it. I'm going to mention it then, so if, you, if you're going to be there, don't make believe you didn't hear this. But I felt like, I felt like, remember? I'm giving my age away. But I remember someone saying, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I just felt, the minute, the minute she asked me, I said, it's like, don't ask what the church can do for me, but what I can do for the church. It's yeah. like, wow, that was, that was sort of neat. That was a neat kind of thing. Um, first and foremost, big time. We believe in the power of prayer, or we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. So I, I just ask you to, uh, to continue your, your, your prayers. Um, so, with that sort of like elephant, sort of like, Partially fed, at least give an appetizer, give an idea. I just wanted to to share some of that, some of that with you. Back to the two scenarios. How did the church fail the woman? In my letter, particularly regarding the Eucharist, I thought I just want to share with you what's been some of my experience of Eucharist, the Mass. I need to be, and perhaps you might number yourselves, mostly I'm pointing to myself, 
Okay, but maybe you, it resonates with, with some of you. First of all, I think we need to be conscious of the vocabulary we use. For instance, I mean, we grew up saying it, but I think we need to be attentive to what we say. We go to Mass, we say Mass, we say our prayers. Those words don't speak of engagement. To me, anyway. They don't speak of a dialogue. Or I, I read my breviary, you know. Um, we need to, I think, use words, especially as we're leading in the parish, and whatever, whatever role we have in our parishes. Be conscious of the words that we use. And just, if you find an opportunity, instead of saying, go to Mass, Maybe we can say celebrate Eucharist or participate. Uh, just look for opportunities. Make an effort to look for words that speak more of engagement rather than spectating. Okay. Um, secondly, the, and you've heard this, and, I, and I've heard about a, a wonderful response, at least um, when I was in the reservation of all places at a meeting. And, uh, some people come back from a workshop on hospitality. I, I don't know. We, we don't get it. We don't get it. You get it. But we don't get it. <laughs> Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, one woman, former parishioner of mine, um, was in a, went to a college down south working on her doctorate. There was no use for religion in her classes, education. She went to another, a college university, a Catholic university, working on another doctorate, and she would go to the, to the church, to the school, to the school, university chapel for mass. She said uh, she was there, a year and a half, and nobody asked her who she was. Nobody acknowledged her. Nobody said, boo. And it's like, I can just think, I'm growing up, so I, I guess I'm pointing at myself. You say hey to the folks you know in the pew, and you talk about the stranger once in the park, when you're in the parking lot. But we, we, we just, for whatever reason, we, we don't take the step forward to say, hello, my name is. It's great to see you here, you know? And uh, you know what I was thinking of when I was first stationed in, in Florida? I can remember the first time I was out walking the sidewalk in Pensacola on days. And I'm just minding my business, just walking, and I, I met a couple. I know I'm not supposed to move. You're fine. I met a couple. You can move wherever you want. I met a couple, and they, and they said, hello, how are you doing? They started talking to me. And it was like, I don't know you. I said, I don't know, but there was hospitality there. A total stranger. And, and there's, something, there's something lacking there. And just this past week, one of the diocesan staff told me that she had gone to Mass for the past couple weeks. One of the large, a large church sat in a pew and a couple of parishioners made a big stink with her because she was sitting in their pew. Now this huge church was probably 20% occupied. But that's what, and one was an older, and one was a younger person who were very clearly disturbed, perturbed, because someone was sitting there. You know, we laugh, but how does that make you feel? When you, and we do that. Um, and, that's, and that's our Eucharist. You know, that's something missing. How do you teach someone to be kind, to be nice, to be attentive to the person that, that you meet? I, I don't know. By example, I, I guess. And um, that's all part of that 
it seems to me of, of Eucharist and feeling comfortable in, 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 a, in a worship space. And, you know, being comfortable and start to sharing what God's doing in your life. Or seemingly not doing. And, and it seems to me that that woman didn't have that opportunity to have that kind of exchange. Um, Another element is, again, tied in, is this, the idea of presence and attentiveness. A um, few examples. Again, uh, I'm not trying to point fingers, but it's something I notice, something I do, um, and I try to work on, but um, something sometimes for me is distracting as a presider when it comes to our behavior during Mass. Um, I'll tell you what impresses me. You know, you know, maybe he doesn't think much, you don't think too much of it. But I'll tell you, the person who comes up for communion and they hold their hand out and they're callous. <laughs> and I see dirt in the wrinkles. And I'm saying that person's, you know, living off the fruits of the earth, knows what it is to work, and is not too tired to go to church. I'm impressed with I'm impressed with that. I gulp. I gulp. Um, I gulp too when I say the body of Christ and someone says, thank you. <laughs> oh, oh. Amen. I believe. So be it. Thank you, Father. Well, I like polite, but <laughs> amen. <laughs> and sometimes there's nothing. And I will say the amen for the person if I don't hear anything. Amen. Or they're coming up. Oh, no. <laughs> oh wow. Or we're at mass and you're at a church and I don't understand. It sounds like some pet peeves of the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking Eucharist. We're talking Eucharist. We've got to be engaged, folks. If we, if we really, really believe that Jesus Christ is present, it doesn't get any better. And so we, we have to foster that. We, we, we've, got to, we've got to believe it and, and hang on to it. And, and sitting behind the pillar where you can't see the presider behind the altar doesn't do it for me. You know? <laughs> I don't. I can't understand why, especially when you got all sorts of space. Space. Relax, allow me. <laughs> <laughs> and again, and it's hard. It takes energy to be constantly attentive, and I get that. I understand that. Whether I'm the presider or whether you know, we're sitting in the pew, it takes energy to always be so attentive and have that kind of effort. Um, but with the readings and, and consecration, the readings, even, you know, the, you know, the prayers, you don't need to know they call it the call it the opening prayer or the prayer after communion, but even the prayers, the Eucharistic prayer, if, if we could tune in, every time you do it, it's like reading scripture, you know, a, a phrase may just catch you for the day, and that's all you need. Um, but we want to be attentive to the words that are expressed. And I have to catch myself, one of my predecessors, who used to drive me crazy. And some of the hierarchy today do it when I go to the bishop's meetings and I know the valley does it and I can pick myself. <laughs> Peace of Christ be with you. Oh. <laughs> Peace of Christ, you know, looking toward the next person instead of looking in the eye of the person you're wishing Christ speaks to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of connection. It's important, I think, anyway. Because I wonder, do I mean it? Say it like you mean it, you know? Peace Look at person. You. <laughs> you know, it's important. And again, as leaders, as leaders in the parish, we want to give that kind of, that kind of witness. I know this is silly, simple stuff, but darn it, our folks aren't getting it. Many of them. And, and uh, you talk about getting back to basics, maybe this is one of those things. I have to tell you, within the past month, it was like I had Mass at 
one place that I regularly say Mass at. I won't say where it is. Um, and we had um, beautiful, beautiful Mass. I think there were, I gotta be careful. <laughs> <laughs> we had several, we had a few deacons in the sanctuary. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful deacons. Mass, I thought, went very well. The end of Mass, I'd go to the back and greet people. This one guy made a beeline. I, I see him in church. Wonderful guy, you know, see him regularly in church. He made a beeline for me. He had eye contact with me. Wasn't terribly interested in shaking my hand because he was pointing my finger. You have all those ministers, those deacons, those altar servers on the altar. There were no altar servers. And not one of them could ring those bells. <laughs> he was dead serious. At first I was going to sort of like chuckle. But this meant the world to him. And I have to remember who I am. Because I want to say something flippant back. <laughs> but it, it was like... Um, that's the Bosley side of my family. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm part Bosley. <laughs> we both don't have much hair. <laughs> but anyway, but I ended up saying, you know, the mass is still valid. You know. But, <laughs> but sometimes we get distracted by the incidentals. Whether we ring the bells or not in that setting, the world wasn't going to come to an end. Um, and so maybe look at your own life. What are those little things that, when you go to Mass, it really, you got to because Father always does this, or the Bishop always does that. And, and does that disable you from entering into the fullness of, of, of the moment? If it does, maybe that's good material to, to pray on. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm getting carried away here. Priest, or the priest or the bishop, is a terrible presider. Or his behavior is reprehensible. Don't deny yourself the Eucharist to show him up for whatever reason. Don't deny yourself the Eucharist. I was reading recently of, uh, of an example. It's like, okay, in the middle of the winter, the power goes off. So, you call Nice Egg. <coughs> I can use Nice Egg because it's self inflicted again, my family <laughs> and others. It's great to have connections here. Um, so, so, Nice Egg finally shows up at the front door. And he's got to get to the back of your house to check out some circuitry. Well, he's sort of grumpy when he comes in. Those muddy boots <laughs> all over your newly waxed floor just trips <laughs> right straight through like nobody's business. And um, gets to where he's got to go and um, fixes what he has to fix. Well, you know, you're so perturbed. I don't want anything from that. Like, I don't want any power. So it's like, it's like, well, okay, because of the agent, the man, you're robbing yourself of power. Does that make sense? The benefits of electricity because of the behavior of one of the representatives of the power supplier. Now, I know sometimes it, for whatever, uh, maybe I have, not maybe, I have my own idiosyncrasies when it comes to liturgy and, and whatever. And our priests do as well. And maybe there are some things in relationships with the priests and, or the deacons that, that really irk you. And I know how difficult it can be sometimes. But that's, that's remember that story. Don't rob yourself of the Eucharist. Even if he's grumpy, he's got dirty shoes. <coughs> you know? So, to what extent does my faith in the Eucharist inform, motivate my faith stance, particularly during incredibly difficult times? One last thing that 
the shortcoming as far as I was concerned, um, the role of Eucharistic adoration. In all honesty, I don't ever remember growing up going to adoration. I don't ever remember having it. Wadhams Hall, minimal. Major seminary, minimal. With some snide remarks by some, uh, if you go to benediction or you go to adoration. Um, some, uh, you know, that's why I'm so glad for those uh, places, those parishes that have adoration. We, we tried at the cathedral for several years having nocturnal adoration and we just couldn't get the folks to come and eventually we, we stopped with the, the all night adoration. Um, I know when I was uh, wrecked to the cathedral, people would say, well, what can, we, what can we do to help you with vocations? And I'd say, come pray with us the holy hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and the numbers don't change. There's something, and, and I can remember, uh, I don't remember the occasion, but Cardinal O'Connor was visiting the diocese, and I can still remember him at the table telling us about those parishes that had Eucharistic adoration see a remarkable response when it comes to church vocations. Whether it's deacons, consecrated religious, or priesthood. And I, and I go to these bishops' meetings and I, and I hear about adoration and I don't know. I, I don't feel it yet. I, I know there are, are pockets. Um, we're talking about presence, folks. And, and so whatever you can do to promote that in your parishes, I think, would be a great gift to the church. Um, because, you see, our culture not only does not support our faith today, let alone the teachings of Jesus Christ, in so very many ways um, we're targeted. We're targeted. And, and that means... We can't depend on other institutions out there or other. We have to pull up our bootstraps and, and, and storm the heavens and with confidence, with, with hope, and with Eucharistic faith, proudly proclaim and live the good news. Um, in the Eucharist, we got Jesus. What else is there? I'm sorry I took so long. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>